So we already talked about the type of uveitis and um, ch choosing treatment, of course, depends on the type and how quickly it's progressing. Um, I should mention up front, I'm focusing on non-infectious uveitis and pretty much everything here is off-label treatment with the exception of um, triessence, Ozerdex, and Redisert. So other things I like to know is whether they've ever been treated and what's worked and what hasn't. Um, of course, if they're diabetic, young, um, very old, et cetera. Um, we all know about eye drops, corticosteroids, NSAIDs, and of course cycloplegics. Um, we all know about periorbital steroids or intravitreal, and we all have heard a lot about Ozerdex, and we haven't heard about Redisert, but that's out there too. Um, and so um, prednisone, prednisolone acetate is the cheapest one, about $12. This is a brief Google internet search on prices, so don't hold me to it. But once we go beyond pred forte, and I don't really put, I don't really care that much about generic versus brand name, but some people do. Um, once, if I'm going beyond generic, then I'm probably going to use Durazol, which is a lot more expensive. And if I'm worried about IO, an IOP spike, I might um, try Lotomax once we're tapering down on lower dose steroids. Um, if they're going to have an IOP um, response with the steroid, uh, Durazol will definitely bring their pressure up and it, it will be higher. So for the periocular steroids, um, dexamethasone um, is cheap, triamcinolone. Um, the standard form is a little more expensive and triessence is the most expensive. Um, periocular dexamethasone really only lasts about 24 hours, so that's not something that I really use um, for uveitics. Um, that's more commonly something you'd use um, in a post-cataract situation or uh, intraoperatively. But if you're going with uh, periocular, then there's a couple of ways to do it. You can pl place it anteriorly in the subtenon space. You can go most, more posterior, or you can go um, to the orbital floor going through the lower lid. And then, of course, intravitreal triamcinolone is an option as well. Um, of the implants, Ozerdex, um, as we heard about, has dexamethasone, and Redisert has flu fluocinolone acetonide, acetonide. Can't talk today. Um, so Ozerdex is less expensive than Redisert. Um, of course, there is a difference in the length of time that steroid is being uh, released. Oftentimes, uh, a strategy that people use is to start with a periocular steroid. If things work well, they don't develop glaucoma, um, then you might move to an Ozerdex. If that also shows effect, you might think about going to a Redisert. Um, the Redisert, of course, is not biodegradable. Um, it's an OR procedure, and it's sutured into the eye. Um, there is a high rate of cataract formation um, by the time you get towards that three-year mark. And um, of those who develop um, increased IOP, about 40% will end up needing glaucoma surgery. There was a recent study out that I don't have time to talk about looking at treating uveitis with steroids, either um, an implant versus systemic treatment. And overall, the visual outcomes were the same. For patients that received the Redisert, their quality of life was better, especially in those early years. Um, patients on systemic treatments had a lot of side effects and um, had a lot of uh, time to get used to those treatments. So um, corticosteroids, I um, already mentioned IOP and cataract. Um, there is some systemic absorption from the, um, the periocular steroids, and so um, this, of course, is important in patients that are diabetic. Um, the intravitreal form, of course, we know about the risk of endophthalmitis and pseudoendophthalmitis. Um, and when I talk to patients about where I might place the uh, steroid, if I'm going through the, for the orbital floor, I always warn them about skin depig depigmentation, especially in uh, patients with darkly pigmented skin, and orbital fat prolapse as that septum becomes atrophic. Um, patients can be really annoyed if you don't warn them about this and it happens. Um, of course, with the retrobulbar or the posterior subtenons um, placement, there's always a risk of globe penetration and rarely the retinovascular occlusion. And then uh, ptosis and allergic reaction if you're in the more anterior space. Other things that we put in the eye for non-infectious uveitis, um, there have been uh, a few studies looking at putting methotrexate in the eye. Of course, we use it for um, vitreoretinal lymphoma. Um, there was uh, one paper out looking at the use in um, uveitic macular edema. Uh, we did a small study at NIH and um, 
didn't see that much effect for macular edema. Um, it would be nice if we had something else besides steroids to put in the eye, but we need to work more on that. Um, rituximab, we've heard about a little bit. That's also used for um, uh, vitreoretinal retinal lymphoma. Um, and something that was tried by um, a group in upstate New York and some other groups was studying putting intravitreal infliximab in the eye. This was actually for diabetic macular edema, and they found um, their patients had decreasing ERG responses. So it's not always a great idea to um, use everything we've got in the eye without um, additional studies. So um, indications, including, of course, anterior uveitis. Um, of course, any time a patient can't tolerate systemic treatment, then we need, need to go to local treatment. Um, and then some of these other indications. And oftentimes, we'll use it in conjunction with systemic treatment. So moving on to systemic steroids, um, either IV form or oral. Um, it's important to try to get down to a lower dose, less than 10 milligrams within three months of starting treatment. And if you can't, that's a time to add other systemic treatment. Um, children are a special consideration um, because I, I always manage children in conjunction with some kind of pediatric specialist, whether it's a general pediatrician or a rheumatologist, because children are still growing and the implications of, um, you know, <laughs> long term implications we simply don't know. So we need to get help when we treat children. Um, of course, we have to watch out for bone mineral, mineral density and um, GI protection, so I always place patients on a calcium supplement with vitamin D when I start steroids. Um, steroids, I think people are, uh, feel more comfortable using them, we're a little more familiar with them, but side effects, patients are pretty much guaranteed to have one of these side effects, and some of them can alter their, them for the rest of their lives. So compared to some of the steroid sparing immunosuppressives, these things can be equally bad. Um, once we move past the steroids, then um, you can co-manage with rheumatology, neurology, pulmonology, and or uveitis as appropriate, and the, the cost ranges from quite cheap to very expensive. Um, when we think about the conventional non-steroid treatments, there's the anti-metabolites, which include methotrexate, um, azathioprine, and cellcept or mycophenolate. Um, this is used less commonly in uveitis. And the T-cell inhibitors uh, most commonly used in the U.S. is cyclosporin, but we've heard a little bit about serolimus. And um, serolimus in a subconjunctival form has been tested for uveitis as well. It's just not commercially available at this time. And then finally, the alkylating agents are kind of the, the ones that are the scariest for those of us who are not um, in oncology or rheumatology, these disrupt DNA strands, and there um, is, a, of course, a risk of cancer depending on the way and how much you use this medication. So I'm going to skip, skip over the pictures here. Um, the biologics are the, the newest drugs, and they're, um, of course, expensive because these target specific molecules. The ones that um, we use most commonly in uveitis include infliximab, which is Remicade, and adalimumab, which is Humira. These two, uh, Remicade is an, an IV infusion. Um, it goes in over a couple of hours. Patients need to be in a day hospital or a, an infusion center. Humira is, a, is an injection. You um, inject it with a pen, kind of like insulin, and it's uh, uh, every two weeks. Infliximab, uh, they dose uh, the first week, then two weeks later, and then every four weeks, and then they sometimes stretch the interval out to about every six to eight weeks. Rituximab um, is also Rituxan, and um, we've been, uh, the rheumatology uh, department here at Mayo has been using that quite a lot in the uh, vasculitides, and it's increasingly used in uveitis as well. Um, this is generally dosed once, and then um, a second dose, uh, second loading dose, I think is a couple weeks later, and then they don't get another dose again for six months. The effects on the um, white blood cell count are um, quite uh, impressive, and so if they run into problems with leukopenia, they're really in trouble. So these, this is a drug that you have to use with care. Um, this is Enbrel, and that's, um, we don't use it uh, primarily to treat uveitis, and in some studies, patients with uh, rheumatologic disease who had not previously had uveitis actually developed it after Enbrel was started. So um, if I see a patient who already has rheumatologic disease and um, has developed uveitis on Enbrel, I, I like to talk to the rheumatologist about maybe considering a different medication. 
Um, Declizumab is no longer commercially available, but when it was available, it was a wonderful drug. It was also an infusion, but only over 30 minutes, and it worked very well with very few side effects. So we're hopeful that perhaps um, a different form of that will be available on the market at some point in the future. It uh, worked best in uveitis. It was developed for MS, but it wasn't commercially viable, so the company chose to stop making it. And then, of course, we all know about the anti-VEGF agents. Um, these are great in, conjun uh, in conjunction with other things, but it's really not good for a monotherapy, although it does, uh, VEGF does have an inflammatory role. Um, you're sort of treating the end result if you're only using um, an anti-VEGF injection. So um, uh, the uh, TNF inhibitors target TNF, which is an inflammatory cytokine. It influences um, all, a lot of different inflammatory responses. It recruits cells. It changes um, vascular permeability. So that's the reason why we try to target it in, in a couple of different ways. Um, Enbrel tar targets the uh, TNF receptor, and um, it can be very effective. So this is one case example of a 24-year-old young woman who's had intermediate uveitis for 12 years. She's been on a lot of other um, immunosuppressives, including methotrexate and a uh, short course of Humira. She's had sub sub subtenons triamcinolone injections. She um, had steroid responsive glaucoma and had a TRAB. And most recently, she's been on Celsept or mycophenolate, and we added cyclosporin. Um, when you look at her early and her late fluorescein, you see she has this loculated pattern of, um, of leakage in the temporal macula, and on her corresponding OCT, she had cystic edema in that area. Um, this was after she had had infliximab, Remicade, um, for six months, and you can see she still has a, a degree of small vessel leakage, especially if you were looking out in the periphery, but the area that's visually significant in the macula no longer has that same loculated um, accumulation of fluid. So some of the things that we don't use as commonly, um, we briefly talked about using interferon. Um, they use it a lot more in Europe, and what the Europeans say is that Americans wouldn't tolerate it because of the flu-like side effects. We're too, I guess we're, we whine too much or something, our patients do. Um, I don't know about that, but we, we simply don't use it very much here. Um, and some of the things under development, um, at NIH they're testing a protein to uh, induce oral tolerance. The idea is to kind of retrain the immune system so that it's no longer attacking the eye. Um, this was tested in a small study and of course tested in an animal, animal model and whether it works um, will be interesting to see. So far, not many side effects from the medication. Um, I mentioned serolimus in subconjunctival or intravitreal forms, and um, many of these medications, if we could put them just in the eye, we could certainly decrease the systemic side effects. So when I'm starting, want to start this medication, um, if the patient, uh, even if the patient seems to only have uveitis, I still oftentimes will have them evaluated by rheumatology. Um, here we have great rheumatologists who are willing to help me manage this medication, although I, I did receive training to manage it myself. I think it's always safest to have um, many people involved with the care of the patient. Um, of course, we want to make sure that they're not, they don't have latent TB. Um, they need to, have, need to be up to date on their immunizations, especially if they're children. Um, and you should revisit the diagnosis of um, infection, um, if necessary, before starting these agents, just in case we miss something. Of course, we um, thoroughly discuss um, everything about this medication, and frequently rheumatology or the rheumatology nurses can be very helpful with that. Um, in general, there's no absolute recipe for treatment. It really depends on, um, on how you were trained and, um, of course, pers uh, the patient, what he or she prefers. So um, for acute or vision-threatening uveitis, um, prednisone or, or some form of steroids still works the fastest, so sometimes getting that patient hospitalized and using solumedrol is the way to go, but IV Remicade also works very quickly, and um, of course cyclophosphamide can be useful as well. Um, for anterior uveitis with JIA, methotrexate classically, um, for once acute inflammation is controlled with posterior uveitis, then we're thinking about Celsept or cyclosporin. Um, cyclosporin we tend to like with macular edema, and if everything, they've failed everything else and they have the insurance coverage, we might be using one of those biologics. 
So um, lab monitoring is very important. Um, I always tell patients about sun protection and contraception, flu vaccines, um, going to the doctor when they're sick, and any new symptoms that are neurological, we have to worry about a rare syndrome um, uh, called PML, and so these are things to watch out for as well. Um, just very quickly here, um, the site study looked at whether or not being on immunosuppressives and I, um, was harmful to your overall health, and so they looked at uveitis patients on systemic treatment versus uveitis patients who were not, versus the general U.S. population, and as a whole, there was no increased mortality and no increased mortality due to cancer for the co most commonly used immunosuppressives. There's less data on the TNF inhibitors, and so um, we always warn patients about this and we simply don't know. So if we're going to start these, we say we think they work well, we don't have enough long-term data, and then we, we basically talk about whether this is something they want to do. So we've already talked, to, we've talked about all these different types of treatments. Um, the main thing is to make sure we don't use prednisone too long, and if, um, if you're not able to get off prednisone, seeking help um, with, uh, from another specialist is uh, the best way to go. So with that... We're at the last slide, and thanks for staying here with us, and um, thanks for attending. It was a great conference, and thanks to Sophie and Ray.